Um, so welcome, Michelle and Erez and Lydia and Austin. Thanks for coming. Uh, what we're going to do today again is we're going to jump into the quiz before we get into all of the um, items that we have to get into. So let me go ahead and jump to the quiz. Okay, so here's the quiz. And question number one, by the way, there's only, a number, there's only question number one. <laughs> and it says the following. These days it is recommended that people who are socializing stay six feet apart from each other in order to not spread the COVID-19. Um, the Forest Service that is in charge of our local Tahoe beaches is concerned that the average social distance that beach growers go uh, are keeping is less than six feet apart. They'll be conducting a study to see if their concerns are valid and need to close the beaches once again. Okay, so let's go through one item at a time. And uh, what I did just to make it easier is I just copied and pasted it in the answer area and that way I can read it at the same time because the calculator is kind of long. Okay, state the null and alternative hypotheses for the corresponding hypothesis test. So here, I'm hoping you all know, is uh, what are the letters that we use for the null hypothesis? Or the letter. Yeah, so we're gonna have H, not. And now we need to state the null hypothesis and the, the null hypothesis. Notice here that the survey question, is it, is it a yes, no question? Or is it quantitative? So what, what are you going to ask, or are we going to write down about this beachgoer? Is the question. So is it quantitative, or is it the yes, no? What do y'all think? Yeah, this is quantitative, because what you're going to ask is, how far are you from your nearest person? Okay, and you're going to write down that number, eight feet or something like that. It's not a yes, no. So we're talking about a quantitative, and notice that uh, we're comparing with six. So in particular, when you have quantitative, we use the Greek letter mu, because we're talking about the mean, mu equals six. Any questions on that? Okay, so now we need to find H1. And this has to do with what are the keywords that are gonna tell us what the inequality is for H1? They're in the question. Yeah, less than. Okay, so that means we're gonna use a less than sign for this guy. So I'm just gonna copy this guy, paste it here, and then go and change that equals and make it a less than. Any questions on part A? Okay, so now let's talk about the ramifications of a type one and type two error. Okay, so, and it says not just the definitions. Okay, I think I asked you uh, last, last week on Thursday, and a lot of you gave me the definitions and not the ramifications. Uh, let's see, how many points will I take off if you forgot to add mu? Probably one. Depends on what's this problem worth. You know, there'll be a, there'll be a deduction. It won't be a, you know, destroy you deduction, but like a point. Okay, you got to have mu equals a number and mu less than a number for this one. Whereas for proportions, you can have a p equals a number and p less than a number. And then today in chapter 10, we're actually going to have a mu1 and a mu2, or a p1 and a p2. So it really matters. Okay, so you do need to have it. If you are mu instead of the Greek letter mu, that's fine. I don't take off points for that, as long as you explain kind of what you're meant. Okay, but if you don't, if you had age not equal six, I will take a point off. Okay, so that's just kind of a, because it is important. Okay, so state the ramifications of a type one error. Let's start with the type one. Okay, so we got to think, first thing, what, it, 
what is a type one error? And this is something you're supposed to remember. And this happened in chapter nine. So what does it mean to have a type one error? idea? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a false positive. So what that means is that they're going to decide that the average distance is less than six feet when it actually isn't less than six feet. And what will the Forest Service do? They'll close the beaches down. Okay. So beaches will be closed down. Because the Forest Service um, deterrent um, finds evidence that the um, distance is less than six. But everyone is keeping social distance. And everyone loses their beaches unnecessarily. Any questions on what a type one error would would do? Any questions on the ramifications there? Okay, what about a type two error? Right, right, that means that now they're not going to be able to to say that people are stay are are not are keeping less than six feet apart. And what's going to happen is that the beaches will stay open, and then people aren't practicing social distancing, so people are going to get sick, okay, and die possibly. So. The um, Forest Service um, will not have evidence that the distance is less than six okay and if they don't have evidence for that then they'll leave the beaches open and we'll leave the beach is open. Okay, but the distance is less than six. And people will die of COVID. I guess I'll throw a 19 there because that's what they call it. They put a dash there at the end. Any questions on that? Any questions on type one and type two error? Okay. Notice, and I, I specified it, not just the definitions. I want to hear who gets hurt, okay, and why they get hurt and how they get hurt. And it's very different. Okay, based on part B, decide on the level of significance. All right, so based on part B, what should the level of significance be? What do y'all think? Which is worse? So which is worse, not being able to go to the beach or dying? 
Yeah, I, I hope most people think dying, you know. <laughs> okay, so that means that the type two error is worse. So, you know, the type two error is worse. So use a 10% level of significance. Any questions on that? Okay. Notice, by the way, if they're both really bad, what do you do? If type 1 error and type 2 error are really bad, what do you do? And this is actually important. Not necessarily 0.05. Turns out what you do is you get a really large sample size and you go 0 0.01. It's the only way to get both good. With a really large sample size, um, chance of type 2 error is small. Okay. And chance of a type 1 error is whatever you let your alpha be. Uh, but if you have a fixed sample size, then you have to make the decisions. Okay, and large sample size, the problem with that is it takes too long, by then people are dying by the time they find out. So there's all kinds of issues. Okay, so check. Okay, and by the way, see this word suppose? I want to let you know that means I completely made up these numbers. Do not go call the press and say, hey, I, I heard about this study that was done. Okay, I made this up. Okay, so don't like quote me on this, but they could do something like this. Okay, suppose the Forest Service observed 48 beachgoers and their average social distance that they kept was 5.3 feet and the standard deviation was 1.8 feet. Find the test statistic and p value for the hypothesis. Let me write it down 5.3, 1.8, and 48. So now I need to go back up. It's not that one. Here. And which number do I use? Which one? Which test? Yeah, this is a confidence interval for a mean with statistics. So I click that. Uh, let me double check, because some of you thought it was something different. Yeah, it's not a confidence interval. So that didn't work. Be careful. We don't want a confidence interval. What do we want? Let me get to it again. It's 46. There we go. Okay. Yeah, we don't want a confidence interval. We want eight. We want um, 13. Hypothesis test for a mean with statistics. But it's important you get to the right one. Okay. So now we just write down what we got. Uh, we don't know sigma, by the way. And in our class, we never will. Okay. So now S was. 1.8, FR was 5.3, N was 48, and mu naught was 6. And we want to see if it's less than, and hit calculate. And there we go, negative 2.69 for T and 0 0.0049 for our p-value. So let's go do it. So that's part D. The test statistic is T 
equals negative 2.69. And the p-value was equal to 0 0.0049. Any questions on the calculation? Uh, uh, did not specify how many dots places on the text. Yeah, um, so this is something you have to get used to. Computer's really picky. I'm not. I don't care how many dots places you take. Okay, so as long as as long as you use the proper rules of rounding, that's important. Um, if you wrote, you know, five five decimal places, that's okay too. Okay. What's important is you know that we're doing a, a T and a P value and which test to use and then how to line up the sentence. Okay, and in terms of real world, that's all that matters. Okay, um, computers are not good at saying, looking at your answer and saying, well, you know, that's good enough. You know, it, computers can't do that. Computers have a specific answer it looks for. That's the difference. Yeah, so that's me versus a computer. Okay, now use a language of statistics, like language discussed in last week's webinars, to state your conclusion. What are the first two words? Okay, so if you put 5.3 and 6 at the wrong places, that's a bigger problem. Because then you actually have the wrong statistic. Does that make sense? Rounding is a whole different problem, but if you switch the numbers in different places, then you actually literally have a wrong answer. And in the real world, that's a big problem. So if you put it in the wrong places and you get the wrong answer, and then you publish a paper or try to publish a paper, it's a disaster. Do you see the difference? Whereas if you ran it two decimals or three decimals, nobody cares. That's the difference. But I'll take off like a point is if you show all your work. Okay, if you don't show any work, then you'll lose lots of stuff because uh, I won't know what happened. I'll just see a wrong answer. Do you see the difference? So showing work's important, especially if you make those kind of mistakes. Okay, so what are the first two words for party? What do you think? Remember I told you the first two words for any hypothesis test, conclusion. No one remembers? There is. That gets you started. If you get those first two words, it'll, ha it'll help you get started in terms of how to write out the answer. Okay? Otherwise, you're gonna get really confused and lost. So it's real important to get, get it down. So there is. And then statistically, that's the third word. And the fourth word depends on what we've done. So what's the fourth word? This is important. Yeah, significant, because the p-value is 0 0.0049 which is smaller than our level of significance, which was uh, 0.1. So that means it's statistically significant. And then evidence. So again, you start out in every hypothesis test conclusion basically the same. There could be an IN before that significant if P value is large because you don't have evidence. So there is statistically significant evidence to conclude. that the population mean, those two words must be in your explanation. If you don't have the words population mean, I take off points automatically. So that's necessary. And if you write proportion, that's bad, by the way. It's, it's mean, not proportion. So the population mean um, distance that, um, Beachgoers stay from each other.
is less than uh, 60. Any questions on part E? It's really important you practice these. If you don't practice writing them out, if all you do is read and click which is the right one on your homework, you're not going to be able to get this. You got to write it out. Okay, F, interpret the level of significance in the context of the study. So that one is a bit longer, but it always kind of starts the same. So it's kind of the, uh, as I wrote uh, Thursday, the general idea is if H naught is true and another study was done, then there would be that percent chance of a type one error. Okay, so now let's say if an H naught is true. So now we go down, look at H naught. H naught says mu equals six. So if mu is six, well, what does that mean? If the mean, if the population mean, distance for beachgoers is six feet. And if another study or another um, 48, because that's how many we had people, actually beachgoers, were observed, then there would be a 10% chance that we decided our level of significance was 10%. 10% chance that the Forest Service, because that's who's doing it, would falsely conclude that the population mean difference mean um, distance is less than 60. Any questions? Any questions at all on Any questions? Because it's important if you, that you do ask questions if you have them. That's the whole point. So I don't want to just talk and you have no idea what I'm saying and then, you know, then you're confused. Any questions? Okay, so I want you to promise something. Promise that you'll practice this, okay? In the next 48 hours, that's all you got, okay? Write it down. Okay, you could practice typing it. That's good. Uh, or you can practice um, on paper, pencil. Typing's probably even better though, because your test is going to be on computer. Okay, so in whatever you know, whatever form it doesn't matter because you'd be typing on a keyboard in this, but which you won't be able to get into. But at least that won't matter whether you're doing it in a Word document or Google Doc or whatever your favorite thing is. Yeah, you can squeeze in your note card, but you also want to practice writing it. Because remember, you're going to have to practice. The, the note card's great, but I tell you something. It's not going to be pretty for you if, I, if you have the word beachgoers in your explanation on the, on the exam problem. <laughs> because I'm not giving you a question about beachgoers. Just let you know that. So, so again, uh, I know you're saying, of course, but I'm telling you, I've been teaching for a lot of years. There's always somebody that just copies down exactly what I gave in the example and doesn't even pay attention. So make sure that you're not talking about beachgoers, you're talking about whatever, whatever the question is talking about, okay? Okay, um, you like drop downs like on, yeah, no, you don't get drop downs. <laughs> yeah, there's no multiple choice on this one. This is you type in. Okay, the reason why it's drop downs and it's an A, B, C, or D is the computer is grading it. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not, I'll be grading your, and that's what, one reason I really make sure I give you quiz problems so that you practice what the test is going to be like. 
it forces you to do that. Okay, any questions at all on this? Any questions? Second, I need water. Okay, if there's no questions, I'm going to do what I like to do. Um, and what I like teaching this class actually is I can go to the news <laughs> and we can go look at stuff. And I decided I didn't want to get, I didn't, I didn't want to just do only coronavirus. It gets really um, depressing after a while. So I, I picked a different, a different example. Um, which I found on Pew. Pew is a good, um, a good place for me to find things because it has all the information statistically also instead of just the result that the media usually just shows. Um, so this is uh, Pew, which according to Google is a nonpartisan um, kind of survey and news um, place. And here's the article. Dating and relationships in the digital age. So I think I just think a little bit happier. <laughs> okay. So from distractions to jealousy, how Americans navigate cell phones and social media in their romantic relationships. Okay, so they did a study. And I'll read some of it to you. It is amid growing debates about the impact of smartphones and social media on Romantic Relationships, a Pew Research Center survey conducted in October 2019. Okay, and by the way, they did it before all this coronavirus stuff. So this was like normal times. Hopefully, hopefully maybe to October 2020, maybe we'll get close to getting back. We'll see. Finds that many Americans encounter some tech-related struggles with significant others. Okay, I'm not gonna read the whole article because we only have so much time but I'm gonna read a little bit of it. So partnered adults age um, 50 and under are particularly likely to express the feeling that the partner is distracted by their phone. With those 30 to 49 most likely to report this, fully 62% 30 to 49 year olds and 52% 18 to 29 year olds who are in romantic relationships say their partner is at least sometimes distracted by their phone okay. when they're trying to talk to them. All right, so here's the thing, okay? And we're gonna pretend that we're, I'm doing this before we read the article, because that's what Pew did, is they looked at this before they got the article and they wanted to find out if there were differences by age and stuff like that. So, Oh yeah, I, know, I figured out to do that when I forgot. I was reading about to say it. I, I'm gonna do that um, when I go over the test, because that's when the stuff comes. <laughs> I'm gonna let you talk then. Sound good? Right now, people are less stressed because I'm talking about chapter 10. Okay. I will let you know, by the way, chapter 10 is not officially on the exam, but most of chapter 10 basically takes what we did in chapter nine and makes a small adjustment. So if you don't know chapter 10, then if you have struggled with chapter 10, that means you probably didn't learn chapter nine. And then it'll be a problem because chapter nine is important. So, you know, you should still pay attention, but when you're studying for the exam, don't study the details I'm going to talk about. But understand hypothesis test does that too. Okay, so here's the question I have Are 18 to 29 year olds less likely to feel that their partner is distracted by their phone? Okay, and I should say not more than compared to. Compared to 30 to 49 year olds. Okay. Every, any questions on the question? Okay. So that's the question. And by the way, that's not the same thing that says, that's not the same thing as saying are 18 to 29 year olds less distracted on their phone. Why is that different?
It's a bit subtle, but it's important. I don't see y'all jumping in. Okay, imagine reality. You got, you got the couple. <laughs> They're 20 years old. And what are they both doing? They're both on their phones. <laughs> And they're not going to complain to each other. <laughs> you see that? So whereas the 30 to 49 year olds, one might be on the phone and the other going to complain. Do you see the difference? <laughs> so be careful about you know what this is saying. It's saying that, that they're they're complaining that their partner is distracted, not that their partner is distracted. Do you see the difference? And those little things matter a lot in the real world. Okay. So that's the question. All right, so now, as always, when we have a question like this, what we want to do is we want to write this out in symbols as a null hy hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. Any questions on the goal right now, on what the goal is? Okay, you should all know the first three symbols for the null hypothesis, because that doesn't change in chapter 10 at all. What is it? That's something everyone should know. So what are the first three symbols for a null hypothesis? It's always the same. Chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12, chapter 13. Yeah, H not with a colon. So I'm going to write H, zero, colon. Okay, now things are going to, this is where things are different. Okay, unlike what we did in chapter 9, where you had one group, you surveyed the one group, and you wanted to find out if that was less than some number. This is we have in chapter 10 and this example, we have two different groups and we're comparing the two different groups. And I'd say over 90% of all studies I've ever seen do that. Okay, the comparison, comparison is the most important thing. That's what people usually care about. And in this case, first thing, the survey question is, is it a yes, no question, or is it a quantitative question? Yeah, this is yes, no, because you're going to say, is your partner distracted? And the person's going to say, yes. <laughs> OK. Um, so because it's a yes, no question, we're talking about proportions. But now we have two proportions. We have the proportion for the, I'm going to call it the younger group and the proportion for the older group. Okay, 18 to 29 is younger than 30 to 49. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert equation so I can write it nicely. And that is P sub Y for young is equal to Let me do it one more time. P sub Y is equal to P sub older, O for older. Any questions on H naught? So your question is, could you do P1 equals P2? Technically, you can, but here's the problem. When you write P1 equals P2, if you're going to do that, then you have to write a sentence on what P1 means and what P2 means. Because otherwise, it's not clear which is one and which is two. Does that make sense? Whereas if you use the first letter of what you're talking about, then it's pretty clear, right? Especially if you say it, and then everyone will remember it too. Okay. And then the alternative hypothesis, I'm going to use H1. Sometimes, again, you'll see HA, but more, light, more often is H1. 
And then we do exactly the same idea, except what inequality do we have? What's the inequality here? And the key is you got to read the, the sentence above. Yeah, less than P sub O. Do you see it's not that much different than what we've done in chapter nine? It's a little extension, um, but it's very important to know how to do this because as I mentioned, most, most studies are comparison studies. That's what most people care about. Okay, it could be before, after, it could be male, female, it could be young, old. There's lots of different things people compare. It could be with advertisement, without advertisement, whatever it might be. But there's, but usually it's comparison study. Could be um, placebo versus the medication if you're doing a medical study. That's another one that you'll see. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so there's a comparison study. And there's H naught and H1. The next thing we need to do is we need to um, decide on the level of significance. Think about type one, type two error, nothing's changing. And in this case, this is just for an article. They're not doing anything, right? They're gonna publish or not publish, okay? No one's dying if, you, if they get it wrong. Do you agree? So in that kind of situation, what do you always use for the level of significance? You're all supposed to know this. Yeah, 0.05. So 0.05 is the standard level of significance. Again, if they publish and Turned out that it wasn't true that, you know, that young people are less likely to feel distracted. Yeah, you know, their reputation goes down a little bit. And vice versa, if they had a type one error and they uh, said it was true and it wasn't, then yeah, you know, they don't get the published paper. But there's no real horrible damage, right? This isn't one of those. It's not like the Forest Service one that I gave you where there's some you know, pretty bad damage, like deaths. Okay, so this one's not, so 0.05 sounds good. Any questions on that? Okay, the next thing you have to do, this took me a while because the article is four pages long, is you have to figure out what the data was and stuff. So a couple things, one is that, let's read the article, uh, for the, 30 to 49 year olds, let's see. There were 62% for the 30 to 49 year olds and 52% for the 18 to 29 year olds. Okay. Similarly, you also have to find the sample sizes. And that was on page four. So I'm doing all the work for you, which is trying to find this thing, but they gave it to us. And the age 18 to 29 was 802 people. And the 30 to 49 was 1,630. Any questions on that? Okay, and that was in the article. Not a trick question or anything. So what I did is I typed it out. I wanna mention something. Note that right here, this is p hat, not p, is a 0.52. And the other p hat was 0.62. So in particular, I guess if I want to do it even better, I'm going to go p hat sub y and p hat sub o, and similarly n sub y. Oops, that one to go insert. And n sub o. Is it a problem that the sample sizes are different? You think that's a problem, right? We have 802 versus 1630. 
Is that a problem? Yeah, not a problem at all, okay? You do not have to have the same sample sizes when you're doing a hypothesis test for the difference between the okay. What you do need is not just N is large, you need NP and NQ to be large. So um, I'm just gonna kind of do this somewhat in my head. I can in my, and I hope you all can too, that 802 times 0.52 is bigger than five. Okay, and 802 times 0.48 is bigger than five. Similarly, 1630 times 0.62 is bigger than five, and 1630 times 0 0.38 is definitely bigger than five. So it's it's still N, P, and N, Q, but now there's four of them. Is that clear? So that means that the sample size is large enough to actually conduct the study and to use the normal distribution, which is what, what happens in the math behind all this. Any questions on that? Any questions? Okay, so now once we've got that, the next thing we need to do is get this into a calculator. And let me write these down so I don't forget. Uh, eight, Thirty point six. Okay, so let's go, and I want to show you the calculator. Let's see if you have an idea. Go down to the bottom now. Which of these we're going to use? Yeah, this one's 18. Two proportions. Okay, so the sample size, the first one was 802. And the number of successes, that one I have to figure out 0.52 times 802. So I guess I do need NP. 0.52 times 802, 417.04, uh, but we should round because these are the number of people who say yes. So 417. Okay, and then we're gonna go to 1630 times 0.62. And I get a thousand and eleven. And that was sixteen thirty. Any questions on that? Okay, by the way, if we wanted a confidence interval, you could do that. Maybe I'll put a point nine five just to show you that it could be done pretty easily. Okay, uh, but that's not what we're interested in, but I figured I'd, I just wanted to show you that it could be done. We had, if you remember, let's go back. H naught is PY is less than PO, and PI were the young people with the 82, what, 802. So less than is correct. And I hit calculate. What happens if you leave, I'll tell you, if you leave the confidence level blank, it just gives you, it gives you back the, um, the sample proportion difference. And you'll notice the same numbers. So it basically doesn't give you confidence interval. So that's what happens. Um, so nothing hurt, not, you don't get hurt by it, but I just wanted to show you that you could put in a confidence level if you want. Okay, notice that our test statistic is Z equals negative 4.7 about. Notice that that's a Z score of negative four without even looking at the P. You should know that that is very, very low, right? Remember that three 
negative three is considered the bound for an extreme outlier. So negative four is even, is absurdly extremely rare. Do you see how that works? And we see that because the p-value was point zero 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 one, tiny, tiny. Any questions on that? Okay, so we have a really low p-value. Let me write down test statistics is 4.7. Z equals 4.7. And the P value is equal to 0. Point, actually, I think I copied and pasted it. So there we go. Any questions on that? Okay, so the idea here, you should all know what this p-value tells you. What the conclusion is going to be because of this p-value. So what, what is the conclusion when you have a p-value really tiny like this? You're all supposed to know. Yeah, statistically significant. And in fact, when it's really small, you like to brag a bit. <laughs> That's what I like to do. And we could say there is strong statistically significant effort. So you can you could say it's statistically significant, but you might as well like really pound in the, that you got it that there's so little worry about a type one error because p is so tiny that you've got it okay to conclude that the proportion of all 18 to 29 year olds who feel that their partner is distracted by their phone. I'm going to actually cut and paste that because I can. Who feel that their partner is distracted by their phone. Is less because that was our inequality was less than the proportion of all nine-year-olds who feel that their partner is distracted by their phone. Any questions on this? Is it feeling like chapter 10 is not that much different than chapter nine? Okay, I'm hoping it does. If it doesn't, you have a lot of studying to do, like a whole lot of studying to do for the exam. Because this is basically what we did in chapter nine, except we have twice as many numbers to plug in. But the ideas are the same. We're still looking at Type one, type two errors. You're still finding level of significance. You're writing a normal turn of hypothesis. You're still finding a test statistic and p-value. You're using the p-value in the same way, and you're still stating a conclusion. Okay. I don't think I'm going to do the whole thing, but we can do what we did before with the um, level of significance and interpret it. I'll say it, but not type it. So you could say that if the population proportion for 18 to 29 year olds and 30 to 49 year olds that um, feel their partner is, distra is distracted on their phone is the same. And if we did another study, 
of 802 18 year olds and 1630 30 to 49 year olds then there would be a if it's a p value it would be almost 0% because that's a tiny 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 percent chance almost 0% chance that we would get a difference between the proportions of, and this is where actually it does help to leave this out, of at least, actually you don't even need that, we can go from the article, I think is even better, so we can see it. Remember we had 52% uh, and 62%, so a difference of at least 62%, uh, uh, sorry, 10% less for the younger group for this younger sample, because that's what they got was a 10% difference. Okay, and similarly, you could do the same thing when you're talking about the p-value, it starts exactly the same, is that if the population proportion for older ones and younger ones were the same, and if you didn't know the study of 802 ones and 600, um, then there would be a, so if we did a level of significance, there'd be a, we chose 5% chance. There would be a 5% chance of falsely concluding that the younger group is less. Any questions on the idea? Okay, so all this stuff is very, very similar. Okay, is that clear? Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is that was the yes no idea. Now let's talk about what happens if you have quantitative data. And there's really two, there's two very different types of quantitative data. Okay, one type is called independent. Okay, so independent means that if you look at the first person who answered the question in this group, and you look at the first person who answered the question in this group, these people have nothing to do with each other. Okay, they're not paired at all. So one thing, obviously, it's not the same person answering two questions, because that person is themselves. It's not husband and wife that are answering a question or brother and sister. It's not, uh, it's not, say, temperature in Tahoe versus temperature in Colorado, Boulder maybe, um, on 30 different days or 35 different days. That would be dependent. It's more like things like if you looked at 30, 35 men and you look at 35 women or maybe 100 women, I don't know, and you wanted to find out GPA. He just grabbed a bunch of men and a bunch of women. Notice the first man has nothing to do with the first woman. And that's independent. So that means um, the order of the data is meaningless. So if you change the first and the second in the first group, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change anything. Okay, the order is meaningless. So the first response is not paired with the, sorry, first response for the first group. Paired with that group A. Is not paired with the first response or group B. Any questions on that? Okay, then there is dependent. Okay, and by the way, first is, and all of the rest. <laughs> so there's nothing special about the very first one, but it's a good way to check. Okay. 
whereas dependent is the exact opposite. Go there. So dependent is not the order the data is meaningless, is it really are paired. So I could just copy and paste and get rid of the word not. <laughs> so the first and all the rest response for group A is paired with the first and all the rest response for group B. All right, and that's how you tell. So again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see how, how you do. I'm gonna give you some examples. I'm just gonna say, say them. And, and I'll type them too. And let's see if you can type in the chat box after I say them, are they paired or not paired? So let's do the first one. So how about we surveyed um, 500 New Yorkers and 500 Californians, I'll just write CAs. And ask them what their income is. I'm going to say was. It's so depressing nowadays. <laughs> Since so many people don't have income anymore. <laughs> okay, so you tell me is it dependent? Or is it independent? Put one of those words in the chat box. And everyone should do it. Yeah, DEP and IN is just fine too. Okay. Well, not anyone, everyone's doing it, but okay. There's a bunch of you here. All right, well, I'm gonna go with at least a few of you that did it. Yes, it's independent. Any questions on that? It's independent because if you look at that first New Yorker, that has nothing to do with the first Californian person that was out. If you switch them around, it makes no difference. It wasn't independent. It was a backward. Okay, any questions on that idea? How about another example? Okay, we asked, we surveyed 55 college students asking them how many calories they consumed. for breakfast, uh, sorry, lunch yesterday, and how many for dinner yesterday? All right, independent or dependent? What do y'all think? You're all supposed to be putting in your answers. Okay, good. This one's dependent because this is, each person is answering two questions. And so that first person's two answers if you switch it, it wouldn't be the first person anymore for, his, for the answers. So it does matter. Any questions on that? This is dependent. Any questions on that? Okay, Let's, um, let me do one more. Okay, let's take a look.
two businesses, two, how about restaurants, were um, observed over a period of 35 days and the number of customers was uh, um, written down over those days. Independent or dependent? What do y'all think? Okay, so let me explain. Okay, it's a good thing we don't go by much of my uh, vote because it's actually dependent. And it helps to think about, well, what is the data gonna look like? Okay, and I'm just gonna make up some dates. Let's say January 1st. And on January 1st, the first restaurant might've had 75 customers and the second restaurant might've had 83 customers. And then maybe they looked on January 4th and the first might have had 37 customers and the second 42, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we're talking about, we're comparing two restaurants, but it's over 35 days. So each day is gonna have two data values. Restaurant one's value and restaurant two's value. So it's kind of like asking one person two questions, except it's asking one date two questions. Do you see that? So this gets hard. This is probably the hardest part where people have trouble of this whole chapter is to be able to decide is it dependent or is it independent? Any questions on that? Anyone confused? Because again, um, I noticed in your guesses, you didn't guess this one right. So any questions on why this is, these are dependent? Okay, and that is, again, the most important thing. No, um, well, what if, see, here's what affects it. In fact, I chose this on pur purpose. What affected it was January 1st. Because we looked at January 1st, both restaurants had a big level and number of customers, New Year's. Do you see that? Lots of people go out in New Year's to eat dinner. Do you see that? Whereas January 4th, not as many people can go out to dinner. So it does affect, okay? The date affects how many people go out in both restaurants. So we're comparing restaurant one to restaurant two, but we're looking at pairing by date. Okay. Right, the restaurants don't affect each other, that's fine. I want it, let me put something down, this is really important. This is like important, not just for this chapter, but the entire class. Never use the word effect. in statistics for our class. Okay, so first thing is um, nothing we ever do will establish cause and effect, okay? The only time you can do that, it turns out, is in placebos type studies, where you have control studies, it's called. It's not a control study, you don't, you know, we're not about effect, we're about paired. Do you see the difference? So it's not that the 75 affected the 83, but it, they're both paired by January 1st. Yeah, yeah, there's a third variable that pairs them up and that's common and that's still dependent. 
just to let you know, I'm not going to get into the details, that's for sure, is that if you have a choice as a researcher between dependent and independent, what do you think is better? Any guess? This is a guess, so don't worry if you get it wrong. I haven't talked about it yet. Okay, it was a good guess. It's it, dependence better. So if you have a choice between the two, dependence is better. Um, and again, I'm not going to do the math for you, but I will let you know that your um, your probability of a type one and type two error is smaller, especially if so. The probability of a type one and type two error is smaller when you have dependent down. So if you can have a smaller probability of a type one, type two error, go for it. Does that make sense? Um, I'm not going to prove it for you because I think you'd all like close your computers. <laughs> That's it. There's some heavy, heavy math in there, but I'm not doing it. Okay, but you you could believe me. So if you have pairing, that helps you get a lower p-value or a higher p-value if h not was uh, true. Okay, so just let you know that. Okay, any questions at all on the difference between independent and dependent? Okay, um, I thought we should do an example. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you guys, um, but I, I want to make a rule. The rule is I don't want you to spend more than five minutes collecting data. You're, the, all the time should be doing the statistics. So just come up with something really fast. I'm going to break you up into two groups. And I'm going to show you something, by the way, in the calculator. It should be pretty obvious anyway, I think. But because I tried to make it obvious, there's independent and there's dependent. And notice that there's two independent samples with statistics and data, two dependent samples with data. Um, you don't really do dependent samples with statistics though. Because if you just grab the statistics, then you don't have that ability to compare. It turns out in the mathematics, um, when we look at dependent data, you actually take your numbers. Let me show you my example again. 75 and 83, and you subtract them. And 75 minus 83 is um, negative uh, 8 and you get a new data value called negative eight. Whereas 37 minus 42, that is negative uh, five. So you have negative eight, negative five, and what you do is you get one data collection of differences. You don't have to do this, but the reason why there's no reason to program in two dependent samples um, with statistics is that you really have to do the data individually. So that's how you're gonna see it. If you only are given the statistics and you want to do dependent samples, you can't. So that's the reason, okay? The statistics for individual data sets. If you are given the statistics for the difference of the da data sets, you can actually do it. But I thought that was too complicated, so I won't give you one of those anyway. Any questions on that? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to break you into two groups. Let me stop the share. I think we have enough. Yeah. So I'm going to break you into two groups. And one group is going to do dependent, and the other group is going to do independent. And I want you to just collect some data. It doesn't have to be a lot of data. Small data sets, all right. Not in the real world, it's not, but this is just a little practice thing. And I'll be here to help you out too. Okay. And so Anna, is Anna still here? I don't see her. Hmm. Well, maybe Anna will be here. <laughs> yeah, it looks like she stepped out. Okay, but I'll be here to help you out. Um, so I'm gonna break it into two groups. If that works. And what I'm going to do, uh, I'll jump into your room and tell you what you're doing.
and the random. And there's make sure you uh, join your group so that you don't leave your partner by themselves. Come on, make sure you join your group. That's important. Otherwise, your partner's alone. Okay, let's continue on. We're back. And uh, unfortunately, we only had one group stay around. I don't know what happened. So um, can you guys present what you did? Can y'all present what you did? Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, how should we split this up? Do you want to do uh, the part? We'll jump in when I lose it. <laughs> Wait, okay. If something's wrong. And then I'll switch halfway. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. So we got the independent. Um, we decided to do the amount of time that Californians spend on their phone a day compared to New Yorkers. Um, we said that Californians spend more time. So our null hypothesis, HO, was U subscore C equals UN. And then our alternative, alternative hypothesis was UC is greater than UN. Yeah, you mean mu, not you, right? Oh yeah, yeah, mu, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then we both made up our own, I think we had like seven in total. So I made up California data and then Erez did for New York and we put it into the, um, um, oh, hold on. Sorry. Put it into the oh into the two independent samples with data hypothesis test and confidence interval calculator, um, and we put all our data into that one and we put the greater than sign, and CL of zero point nine five and then the res if you want to do the rest. Yeah, sounds good. So <laughs> when we plug those points in, um, we got a t we, we got a test statistic where t equaled one point four nine. And then our p-value was 0 0.0807. And then earlier, we decided to use a level of significance of 0 0.05 because the ramifications for the type 1 and 2 error were pretty equal because it's just about phone time. No one's going to be seriously damaged or whatever. Um, and then because our conclusion or because our p-value was bigger than our level of significance, we concluded that there is statistically insignificant evidence to conclude that the population mean of California phone times is greater than that of New York phone times. Great. Any questions? 
the questions? Okay, we didn't have time to do the dependent sample, um, but I do wanna, I think I wanna show you the calculator to make sure you know which one to go to when it's dependent. Um, this, the group didn't get together, unfortunately. So let me share my screen. And if you go to the calculator, then you will see number 19. is two dependent samples with data. And if you click that, then all you have to do is put the data in, separated by commas for data one, and the data two for separated by commas for data two. You choose your levels, you choose your less than, greater than, or not equal to. Okay, and then you choose your confidence level if you want a confidence level and you hit calculate. I do want to make, uh, make you, tell you something uh, that I decided not to do on this calculator. For just about every example I've ever seen in my life, you're always saying that H naught is that they're equal to each other. There could be an example where H naught might be that mu one is like one more than mu two or something like that. One, and that could be H naught. The one time you might see that is in education. So if you do a like beginning of the year test versus an end of the year test, and you wanna show, did they move up a grade level or maybe they did worse, do you see? But it's so rare that I said not to even allow that and put that in the calculator and you will not see that on the test. It'll always be that they're equal to each other for H naught. So that's just a note. I figured I should mention that because it's a small technicality. Any questions on chapter 10? Do you all agree that chapter 10 isn't that much different than chapter nine? Yeah. It's basically the same idea. I mean, yeah, you have two data sets instead of one, <laughs> but, but all the conclusions, everything we're doing is the same. So in a way I just reviewed for the test. That's the good news. But the other thing that's important, and this is where I want to come in here, I showed you this last time, but I also told you you weren't supposed to understand it last time. Now you're supposed to understand it. If you go to two ver stats, then you will see there are a couple columns, or there's column JK, which is the difference for independent, and then there's NO, which is the stats for dependent difference. Now, you should know the dip, what those mean now. I hope you do, because that's what we spent the last hour doing. And it is important that for your project, you're gonna do one of those two things, and you have to know which one to do. You could do either, but once you've designed your project and you've got your data, then you have to choose the one that your data corresponds to. And unlike exams, um, you can ask me questions and I'll answer them. Okay, so that's why you don't want to wait till the end. You want to make sure that it works. It, and your project must be quantitative, otherwise it makes no sense to have this particular tab here. You also have to use the spreadsheet and that's so that this class transfers. I mentioned that last time. So if you're doing independent differences, what you should do is literally go like that then control C for copy, and then paste it into your project. It must be pasted in. Similarly, if you're doing dependent differences, you grab those, you do control C, and then paste it into your project. And um, if copy and paste for some reason, maybe you're on a Mac or something that's not working well, you could always do a screen capture and copy and paste that way. Any questions on the spreadsheet? Okay, and this is always with data. Okay, for this project. Any questions? Okay, um, just let you know, um, I've noticed that you guys are, you know, making sure you got groups. Make sure you all have a group if you don't panic at this point. So again, you don't necessarily have to start on the project, but you should have partners. It could be two or three people in your group. 
and that's absolute number one. And then maybe right after the test, you can get together and talk about it, okay? And find out what survey you wanna do and what your hypotheses are gonna be. And then you should pop your hypotheses in the project two discussion form. Any questions at all? Okay, I wanna spend the rest of the time talking about the exam. You have an exam coming up on Thursday. So let me go and go in here. Okay, so the first thing is for the exam, I did something, and I don't think I did it last time, but I wanted to help you out in kind of getting an idea of what's gonna be asked, okay? And just to let you know, the exam is a lot like the quizzes. But I'm gonna show you, I actually made a, uh, a semi-copy of the exam and put it in Canvas. So let me show you where it is. No secrets here. If you go to modules, and I'll pretend that you don't have this open so you know how to open it. If you go to modules and you go to week eight, because that's where we're in right now, by the way. And then I put this in this morning, actually. And it's called exam to structure. And what I did is I copied and pasted the parts of the exam I wanted to show you. So I thought I'd start by kind of talking about it. Question number one, look familiar? If you get question one wrong, that's really bad. That means you're not willing to not cheat or you forgot your name, and both are bad. <laughs> okay, so you recognize that one? Okay, question two through seven, and I wanna mention, even though there's a lot of these, they're not worth nearly as many points as the, as the rest of them individually. So I think they're three points each, whereas each of the others are 10 to 15. So don't get scared that like this test is mostly true false. It's not quite that way, but the way Canvas works, is that uh, you can't really do an A, B, C, D very well with true falses. Um, it was easier to make them individual questions. So those are two call it false questions and they're gonna test whether you understand the ideas. And for a lot of people, that those are the hardest problems. Okay. Question number eight. Notice it says paragraph and then, that's not a copy and paste. There is a paragraph in there that I'm not gonna tell you. But then there's parts one through five. And number one, state the null and alternative hypotheses. None of this should be a surprise to you. Number two, find the test statistic, oops, test statistic and the p-value. Number three, write your conclusion in the context of the study. By the way, what are the first three words to the answer of number three? Without even knowing what, what the paragraph was. What are the first three words to the answer? Yeah, there is statistically. Okay, I'm gonna be depressed if you don't have those first three words written down because there it is. <laughs> and you get a note card, got it? So, okay, it may not be significant, it could be insignificant. That's why I only asked for three words. Does that make sense? All right, let me, let me say it again. What are the first three words to the answer to number three? <laughs> there is statistically, do it, got it? Okay. All right, number four. Was the assumption of normality necessary? Explain numerically. Okay, so there are two different types of numerical te of tests to decide whether you need normality. 
What are the two types? So what are the two types of problems that have different ways of approaching them when you're checking the normality? Yeah, proportion and mean. So if the survey question is a yes, no survey question, then you're gonna check an NP and NQ to see if they're bigger than five. If the survey question is a quantitative number answer question, then you're checking to see if the sample size is bigger than 30. Okay, I'm not gonna tell you which this is, but it's one of those two. Okay, question five, or part five on question eight, is based on your answer to part three, was a type one or type two error, okay, either a type one or type two error is of concern, state which one and discuss the repercussion of this error. What does the word repercussion mean? What's the word repercussion mean? Yeah, who gets hurt, who gets hurt, and what damage is done to that individual or that group. Okay, that's what I want you to write about. I don't want just a definition of a type one or type two error. Okay, got it? Okay, problem number nine. There's a paragraph, which I'm not telling you. And then, this should look real similar. Null hypothesis. Find the test stick and p value, state your conclusion, and then I'm going to ask you about the level of significance. And I'm going to have you interpret the level of significance. Then I'm going to, and by the way, what are the first two words? Even the first, um, what are the first one word of the answer number four? Because it helps you get started if you know the first word. What's the first one word? It's a two letter word. Yeah, if, if. Okay, so that gets you started. I'm trying to get you started. Okay, I'm not gonna tell you the whole answer because it's a test, but I will tell you it starts with the word if. Got it? Okay, Pro question five, same idea, but it's the P value. What's the first word for number five? Okay. The answer is if. And in fact, I'll let you know the first phrase for number four and the first phrase for number five are the same. You're doing this in the computer, so copy and paste that phrase. You get it right. Okay. And then the second phrases will be different. Question 10 is a sample size question. How many different formulas are there that we had in our class for sample size questions? So how many different kinds of sample size? Yeah, we had three of them. Practice all of them, not telling you which one I'm giving you, but there's one of them. And you don't wanna choose the wrong formula. So there's a proportions formula with a preliminary estimate. There's a proportions without. And there's a means question, and you should know how to do each of those and tell which type it is. Okay, question 11. There's a paragraph, which I'm not telling you. And then, number one, come up with the appropriate confidence interval. Part two, interpret the confidence interval in the context of the study. Part three, that percent, whatever it is, represents a probability. Interpret this probability in the context of the study. Okay, any questions on question 11? Okay, question 12. For each, write down the distribution, answer the question, and then decide if the assumption that, I'm not saying, is normally distributed is necessary for your calculations. Okay. There's gonna be a paragraph and then there's gonna be 
an A, B, and a C, I think. I think I have three parts or one, two, and three. I think with campus, it's too hard to do A, B, C, so it has to be one, two, three, sorry. Um, any questions? Do you, what, what chapters does number 12 come from? What chapters is number 12 coming from? Thoughts? Remember? Six and seven. So six was the normal distribution, and seven is when you have either proportions or means or um, totals. So ch question 12 is from six and seven. Okay, then the last question is a paragraph. And it's kind of similar to the other confidence interval, but a little different. So the first is come up with the appropriate confidence interval. The second is use a complete sentence to interpret the confidence interval in the context of the study. By the way, what is the first, um, what are the first few words uh, for number two, for part two in both 11 and 13? What's the first word? There's a couple ways of doing it, but what are your first words? Word of words. Yeah, there, so there is, wait, there, um, let's see there. I don't think it's really there. Maybe you have an idea of a there. There is more for hypothesis testing, right? So what's the first word? Not remembering so it's with and then it's with whatever the percent confidence etc cetera, etc cetera. do you remember that so again the first words will help you out yeah so with blah blah confidence we can conclude that and then whatever you're going to be concluding it's between this and that okay and number three Number three is a sample size again, very similar to that first one, the first question over here, where uh, that one. So question eight and question 13, they both have sample size questions. Any questions on that? And that'll be NP and Q greater than five or and greater than 30, depending on whether it's yes, no, or quantitative. Chapter 10 is not on the exam. It will be in the final exam, but it's not on this exam because your homework isn't due until Sunday. I don't feel comfortable making you do that. Um, any questions at all on this exam so far? Any questions? Okay. Um, what are good study tools? Okay, the homeworks are pretty good. I think the quizzes are better, okay? Because the quizzes have you write things out. The test has you write things out, okay? And the quizzes are all in the webinars, by the way with the full solutions. I always do full solutions at every webinar. So you get the full solution of every quiz. These problems are all like the quiz problems, aren't they? They sound, they should sound familiar, do they? Okay, so that's a good study tool. Um, what's a study tool for true false? You know? Ah, uh, yeah, this is a good time. Um, but don't do it, if you, if you type in your hours, uh, Anna, don't do it privately to me. 
Make sure you do it publicly. So Anna, you're up. Hey guys, um, I'll be tutoring tomorrow from two to six and my normal hours on Thursdays are after class, but I'm changing on this Thursday from nine to one. So if you need any help or you have any questions regarding any of the chapters for the exams, I'll be more than happy to help you guys. And if anyone has any questions on how to get to Cranium Cafe, please message me and I'll tell you how to get there. And it's on the syllabus as well. Great, great. And by the way, I'm gonna speak for you, Anna. If you have questions on the project, she can help you too, right? Yes, I can. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you can. Uh, and I can help you. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm in my office hours, but Anna has a lot more hours, by the way, because I'm teaching a lot of hours. But I'm around and I'll answer emails, too. you know, and if you post or whatever. Okay. Um, any other questions? Any other questions? Okay, let me show you one more thing you can do. I think I have it in here. If I don't, I'll show you how to get it. Is it here or if you go to review applets, and you'll see practice true or false questions. Okay, which ones do you think you want to practice? Confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. Okay, so click those, submit. And it'll give you a bunch of true false questions. Believe it or not, I wrote these around 20 years ago. I wrote this app. And then I had to rewrite it because I wrote it in Java and I had to rewrite it. I didn't think, I don't think I changed any of the questions though. Um, so this has a bunch of true false questions that you can practice probably 50 or 60 or so in these two categories. For the final, you want to do it for all of them. Today okay, I was taking so a quiz. And I clicked weird on the calculator and the whole calculator box went gray and disappeared and I couldn't get it back. What if that happens during the test? Cause uh, you know, that was terrible. Okay, so a couple things. Um, let me just show you something about the quiz. I was so afraid quiz, to right? click away. All right, but let me, let me show you about the quiz. If something happens and you lose this calculator, then you have it on the prior problem. Okay. Actually, sorry, this only had one question. Yeah, but if there's only one, and because I went to click on where I keep it special, and it said if I uh, moved away from the page, I would, you know, that was it. So, you know. Right, right, so that what you, you can do, what you can do if, once you're here, um, if you click ancillary material, if you click this triple dot. Okay. If somehow you made a mistake and clicked the wrong button, then you click interactive statistics. Okay. Oh, wait. Uh-oh. There we go. Just a moment. And then it's 40. Great. Right. Then it's number 46, I think it is. 40 something. 46, I think. Let's see. Are you in a minute? Because of. Yeah, 46. Oh, super great. And then you're back. Yeah, it's kind of a pain, but but it's doable. It's knowable, though. I completely freaked yeah. out, of course. Yeah, you could also, if you don't want to do the three dots, you could hit ancillary materials. Wait a moment. <laughs> and then click interactive statistics. That's, an, that's another way of getting it. There's a bunch of ways of getting it. And that should work for you. But hopefully um, you don't click the wrong button. 
because you must have clicked something. You must have clicked some link is what happened. Who even knows, but it happened. Yeah. And so now there's a solution. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think you lost the internet piece. I think you just clicked the link. It just yeah. went weird. Yeah. That's my guess is you clicked with the wrong. I, with one t question on one quiz, that's okay. But, and I could click, I could, you know, I could figure right. it. I could find but every, it. but every I'd question has its own embedded calculator. I'd be terrified to click away uh, on the exam. Right. So what in you want to do is again, there's a whole, there's a bunch. Every question except the true falses, I believe. Obviously, the one that asks you for your name, I don't. You don't need a calculator for that. Um, but all the rest of them have their own calculator. That's so great. you can always go back to one of the others. Super great. Yeah, if you can't find it. Yeah. So there are ways. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Any other questions? I'm going to stop the share, stop the recording. <laughs>